Yeah. Without any further ado, then, we will hear from where is he? Yo! It's our speaker. Oh. Oh. Got him in custody. <laughs> Hiding in the corner. The very modest Kurt Johnson. Oh, that's the one? Yeah. We have handouts of the PowerPoint if anyone wants one. I'll uh, yeah, I like one. All right. Kurt, you're on. Hey, hey. 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 I can't want to hand out. I like you. Yeah, I'm going to Charlie, Charlie. Is there room here? Yeah. Well, good evening, and thank you for getting back. <laughs> And allowing me to speak uh, about my argument, bring my arguments to you again. Good. Okay. Um, this is my topic this evening the inherent physical characteristics of human beings essential for social organization physics. You've heard it all before. I'm just repeating what a lot of other people have said. But, you know, it's the way it goes. I misspelled my own website. If after this you would like to uh, send me a question or stop me from going any farther astray, you can just simply change spell organization correctly in that name, socialorganizationphysics.com, and you can send me an email. I'd be glad to interact with you. So, here's my argument. Social systems are physical systems subject to physical laws, of which there are these three laws that govern them. All social problems that human beings have coped with down through the ages but have been unable to resolve can be resolved with this branch of physics called social organization physics. Bigotry, war, crime, climate change, economic injustice, cancer, they don't need to be argued over or contended with. We don't need to wait a war on anything. These conditions are only symptoms of the underlying problem of our faulty social structures. Now, I argue we don't know how to build successful social systems. Oh, I gotta speak louder. Sorry. Okay, there we go. I argue we don't know how to build so successful social systems today. Any more than 150 years ago, we knew, we knew how to fly. At that time, we didn't know how to build successful flying machines. And I argue once we learn how to leverage these physical principles to build successful social systems, all the problems I mentioned earlier will vanish. They'll prove not to be problems, but something. That's my argument in a nutshell. Last time we discussed these principles to some degree. Tonight, I'm going to extend this argument by exploring us in relationship to these laws. I'll present evidence to suggest our nature is compatible with these identified laws such that we can predictably organize us into a successful social system. And I'd like to begin by defining a successful social system. Now, social systems are systems we've designed to bring order to our interaction in communities larger than families. Religions, governments, political systems, bodies of civil, criminal law, and morality. At their inception, the ambition behind these systems is always to enable a group of people to cooperate in order for all to achieve collectively what none can achieve individually. They never work, they never exhibit, the systems we build never work. They never exhibit cooperation but conflict from the beginning. They never reach their stated goals. 
there is never mutual sharing of benefit, but from the outset, there is an established state of haves and have-nots, and the gap between those two is ever-increasing. But they always break down into conflict, and that leads to collapse. And the source of the conflict is always over who will have and who will have not. Now in April I worked the example of the street system, which I view as a successful social system because in this one area of our lives, they allow us to experience what we seek when we build a government or join a religion or whatever. What we experience on the streets is the freedom to move as we wish, to pursue our own private interests, even as we cooperate with others who are doing exactly the same thing, going where they wish to pursue what is of interest to them. And this, I believe, is not just the pursuit of, but the experience of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness among a community of peers in one small area of our lives. And if we could have this experience across the spectrum of our living, I maintain we would consider ourselves as living in a peaceful social organization. Okay. We would be living in peace. All right. Um, they're asking if you could just keep the mic a little more directional because they're still having trouble in the back hearing you. Okay. So here's my definition of a successful social system. A system which influences the behavior of a population to enable the members of the population to cooperate in order to achieve collectively what none of the members could achieve individually and ensures the members of the community mutual ben mutually benefit in the fruits of cooperation. Now we can turn to what characteristics we bear that make it possible for us to organize in successful social systems. And along the way, I'm going to, I think it's important to challenge certain claims of other supposedly inherent characteristics of human beings that make it impossible for us to build these systems. These are the propositions of evil, irrationality, and currently held ideas of human purpose. That there are evil human beings in our midst that make it impossible for us to live in peace. That we are irrational, and that makes it impossible for us to cooperate. And that human beings either have a purpose to be subject to a king, or they have no purpose at all. So that's what I put up that I need to challenge, and here's the traits I'll put up that I can maintain are universal to human beings. We are self-willed. We are self-interested. We are only, only rational. We are born with an unfinished brain. We are a model-dependent species. We learn through a process of observing per device. And we have a physically identifiable or observable purpose. And every action of every human being is fulfilling this purpose. It is not optional. That's my case. That's where I'm going. Now, I... I've chosen not to identify the purpose for now, and I'd like to leave it unspoken, and we'll get to it. I propose if you come to understand these few characteristics, you'll be able to explain all human behavior. It won't make it pretty, and it will be tragic. It'll probably get more tragic in the short run. But if you understand what causes human behavior, and you understand what causes current conditions, now you have an opportunity to understand what you might have to change to change conditions. And if you want to change the world, you have to know what you need to change to change the world. Let's start with evil. Every school of thought seeking to explain human, our social problems lays the blame on human nature. Listen to the logic and you'll always hear this story. We live in a world we were not meant to live in. A world not designed to accommodate us. One for which we are ill-fit. A world which treats us with hostility. This condition makes us desperate, and this leads to desperate human behavior. On top of that, we are irrational. We 
do unpredictable things and we have no control over our actions and behaviors. Desperate conditions make us mean, nasty, hateful, fearful, greedy, lazy, slothful, horny, corrupt, superstitious, and prone to fight war instead of cooperate. And we would like to be different, and, and some of us have overcome these natures and gotten a good nature, but, but nature herself has cursed us, and we're either sinning or stuck with the Neanderthal brains in a modern world. Though we're all imperfect, the worst offenders are the evil ones. Now, the religious understand evil, evolutionists understand evil, and uh, the governments, a great many governments today, are waging an interminable war against evil, so evil must be real, right? Let me ask you what these things have in common here. White conception, polio, cholera, smallpox, the plague, eye color, wealth, cancer, and climate. Hmm. Let me answer. These were all once believed to be beyond the influence of human beings, and you could do nothing about these conditions, and they were, all, you were always subject to the fates or the gods as to whether these came to visit you. At one time, they were very much like war is today. We had no control over the matter, and we were stuck with what we got, and even though we can conceive another possibility, it's beyond our reach. And there's more. In the time before we were at the mercy of the fates, when the crops failed, an mm -hmm. epidemic appeared, we couldn't fly, we came up with the right, wrong eye color in our child. It was because either we were an evil person, there were evil people in our midst, or there were evil spirits in the neighborhood. Oh, always. That has always been there as an explanation. Thus we created the prayer, prayer circles and exorcisms and hangings and courts and drums and other forms of sacrifice and appeasement to rid the world of evil. Third, when we finally understood how to manage crops, breed for trade, saw polio on fly, and help people who were unable to bear genetic offspring to actually do so, it's always proved out that evil human nature had nothing yeah. to do with the problem. Yes. And ignorance of physics explained our vulnerability. And the fourth is the similarity of the process that led down to our ignorance, led to us understanding these things. And that was physics. And lastly, before we could manage a garden, the flyer conceived in a petri dish, and there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever that what we proposed was possible. So, on the basis of the scientific historical evidence, I, I maintain I'm on the right side of history on this. One day, we will learn to live in peace, and it will prove there's no such thing as evil, and people will look back on this time, and they will wonder at our ignorance that we actually thought evil human behavior explained all of our problems. The same way we look back on people who once believed that witches ruined crops and soured milk. It's just we've got to get to the future to have that view. <clears throat> Oop, missed the page here. Let me back up. So now let me explain the irrational behavior and evil behavior by looking at what is true of human beings. Someone I have missed. Let's, let's begin with this, the inherent powers of self-will and self-interest. Every human being has a unique sense of self-interest and of interests and ambitions, and every human being has a self-will or motility or physical capacity to act to the end of achieving these goals. We're talking big and small. Eat to satisfy hunger, get married, become a scientist, save the whales. The interest one has relates to the conditions in one's life, 
I mean, and the interests are drives to improve one's life, whether that to be to change oneself or change the world, in order to make the world a better place and our experience a better one. All of our drives are to improve the world and our experience in it. If you study carefully, you will observe all of us use what tools we have at our disposal to fulfill our own self-established purposes. <laughs> the methods or activities we undertake to achieve our ambitions is dictated by our beliefs about how to achieve these objectives and what is within the realm of our physical possibility. Some who want a transcendent consciousness take acid, <coughs> others take up meditation. Some who want to change society become charity workers, others get political, yet others join armies, and others join gangs. People who want to get rich go to law school, deal drugs, start a business, try to invent something, <coughs> write a novel, or set up Ponzi schemes. Everyone has a unique idea of what is important and how to get there. But everyone is working against self-interest and using self-will. Now these are inherent powers, but they're not inherent rights because you can be stripped of them. Slavery strips your self-will. And when somebody drafts you and sends you to the army instead of allowing you to go to school and study mathematics, they strip you your self-interest. The record suggests all through civilization, we've been working on a premise that the inherent, these two inherent characteristics are a fatal flaw. We have an idea to find unity as a people. We must find unity of purpose or interest, and we must organize everyone's energy to the fulfillment of that community purpose. We've been waging a war on what we call self selfishness and self-centeredness and self-activity forever, trying to make people other-interested and selfless. The idea is you have to quit being concerned for yourself and learn how to work for the benefit of the whole. And if you do this, of course, your rewards will be great. <coughs> Here are the two causes of social conflict. The first is the battle waged between those who try to strip others of their self-interest and self-will and those who are not going to give it up. The second is the battle between groups to see whose group purpose is going to be imposed on the whole community. We try to defeat self-interest and self-will, but you can't because you see it's a plague on us. Every child born brings a new case. When we say self-interest and self-will, are the characteristics that hinder our progress towards unity. It isn't true. We say this is what stands in, our, in the way of our building true community. That these are flaws in human nature. I don't think so. Because we are not alone with these characteristics. You see, self-interest and self-will drive the universe. Let me explain it this way. Outside of human activity, you see a lot of interaction among diverse populations. With, and these diverse populations have diverse interests and even conflicting interests. And those populations are organizing to create collectively what none of the individual members of those populations could create for themselves. And the results are beneficial. Nature is an interacting and interdependent system of species. And the sum of their interaction is the maintenance of the environment upon which every species is dependent. By definition, that's a successful social system. And every species 
bears these two identical traits, identifiable traits. Some element of self-will and some element of self-interest. The self-interest trait is what we call instinct. The self-will trait is the ability to act on that interest. Trees can't walk, but they can bend and twist to either get the sunlight or even protect their bark from being exposed to north wind. Now, there's another body, the great collection of atoms that makes up everything and creates everything that we can see, feel, touch, even makes us up. Here's an organization that shows no sign of external management, but they too somehow organize into configurations and produce outcomes that none of the atoms themselves could achieve. Hydrogen and oxygen make water, something that hydrogen, is, hydrogen, is, hydrogen isn't and water isn't, or oxygen isn't. Again, that's what we strive to do when we build a, success, a social system. Build something we can't do of ourselves by working together. Now, atoms have a dose of motility, a source of internal power, and they have a sense of self-interest. You see, they bear electrical charge on how it works, but they are compelled to drive to neutrality. Atomic or chemical reaction can simplistically be described as no more than the disruption of neutrality and the ensuing pursuit of neutrality. Atoms, as do all plants and animals and human beings, have an inherent drive to a more satisfactory state and the self-will or power to move to that state. <coughs> and everywhere you look, there's this drive to satisfaction. Forces that seem to disrupt the satisfactory state and a resumption of the drive to satisfaction. The birds fly north in spring because the climate's hospitable and when conditions change, they fly south. No external management, only changing conditions and self-interest and self-will cope with the changing conditions. It's just a fact. We see the same thing on the street systems. They work because we leverage these two traits. Self-will, self-interest. Everyone's doing, taking care of themselves. People use their own self-will to navigate the streets and they do it safely because it's in their best interest. We respect the street system because it helps us achieve our greater interest. We cooperate with others because it's in our best interest. Now notice how governments and religions and other social systems differ. The structure is always the same. They are topped, if you will, by individuals who have been granted an excessive degree of power, of interest and self-will. These, these people who top these organizations are allowed to choose the purpose of the community and then they're granted the power to drive the community in the direction they want. When a president decides to go to war, everyone in the country goes with him. You may not go to war, but you will pay for his war. And if you decide to resist, the president has been given the resources to turn the guns on you to make you change your mind. It's outsized self-interest and outsized self-will. The lofty idea, idea behind leadership is we're going to go find selfless leaders who will not think of themselves but of the community. They will work the will of the people and they'll make decisions that are in the best interest of the community. And they'll take the community where it desires. It's an impossible dream because the community doesn't have desires. The individuals in the community have desires and they all have in, individual and distinctively different Wait. desires. And the other side is they can't work because people can't be other interested. They can only be self-interested. It's just a fact of physics. Once given an, an outsized power of interest and will, a human being will always and forever convert that to self-interest and self-will. It's a physical reality, and you can't overcome it. Anyone given self-interest and 
and self -will, outside self-interest and self-will will utilize that to increase their ability to exercise self-interest and self-will. They'll do this by using that power granted them to weaken others. But this is why, without exception, people are always betrayed when they elect a president or choose a king. But it's not that the kings and the presidents are evil. Or it's not that the people are fools. It's physics is physics. So we keep electing and voting and shouting along with the king because we can't conceive of another alternative. And the alternative is to physical laws of organization. Physical court. Physical laws of social organization. But that's not tonight's subject we are. I need to move on to the human brain. Every human being is born, every human being is born with an unfinished brain. And this contrasts with other species of animals which are born with a fully formed brain. These fully formed brains have instinctive behaviors of self-interest against which the species organizes its motility. We are unique in that we are born with a half-baked brain and we can identify an instinctive behavior to this brain. We seem to have an instinct, have a, have a condition of having an immense power and capacity as a species but no grand useful purpose to which to apply this power. Individually, we can't function without purpose, but collectively, we can't seem to find a purpose to work around. We've always understood, unless we work against a common purpose, we'll never solve our social problem. It really seems like we've been dumped in this world with this giant brain, but no duty to carry out with it. We lack a roadmap for our lives. And so we just have to start where we are and pick up and, and try to pick our way and hope we make good choices along the way. It's just the way it is. And we envy the animals because they don't seem to do this. They just go out and do their job and move along and don't have to worry the things we do and don't have to worry bosses and time clocks. They just get to fly and run and all that stuff. And, or us. We're not the only species dumped in this world without a uh, roadmap, by the way. That's the story of the atoms again. They, too, look like they're plunk in the universe with no direction, no plan. And a lot of them are just moving around chaotically, it seems. But then on the other hand, in their case, over the last billion years, they created, quite by accident, so we say, this universe with this fantastic solar system and this gorgeous planet with all the life forms on it that are so important to our survival. And ironically, we have this giant brain good for taking all this over, we say, and giving it a purpose and meaning where it had none before we came along. Let's go back to this brain. Evolutionists have come up with an idea, have an explanation of why this brain is unfinished and it has to do with survival. And everything in evolution is only about survival, right? But this is the story they tell you. The fully formed human brain in a skull big enough to hold it would be too big to pass through the human female birth canal. So nature, out of the desire to survive, decided to cut the cut the baby in half, so to speak. It would give the baby an unformed brain and it would make it dependent on its parents far longer than any other species baby. And there's no scientific evidence to that. And I'm going to challenge that idea tonight. The reason human beings are born with an unfinished brain correlates to the accomplishment of human purpose. The purpose human beings can't dismiss.
what we do know about the human brain is all normal brains bear an amazing variety of capacity. According to, according to many scientists, the Rube Goldberg machines, they don't work very well, but they get their job done, their patchwork. And if they were a really good brain, they have memory. A better memory. We have a lousy memory. It's not near as big as our, our capacity to calculate. And everybody knows how reliable the eyewitness is, right? Well, let's review how this red brain works. And I, when I was here last, I believe I mentioned Noam Chomsky was the first person to know. That all, nor all normal brain human beings have the inherent capacity to acquire a language. And they have no, but the language they acquire has no inherited characteristics to it. You don't get the language of your ancestors or even your parents. You get the language of the community you exist in at the time you come of age to acquire a language. We're not taught languages so much as we acquire languages. We observe people use words and we come to understand the meaning of those words and then we use those words to achieve what we, know, what we can achieve with them. We say mama when we want her, and we say cookie when we want one, and we say owie when we've got one, right? We learn language. And the cool thing about it is, we not only, Chomsky pointed this out, it's true, we not only learn the words, but without anyone teaching us, we learn the correct grammar for the community we're born in. We learn, learn the rules of grammar, and we learn how to make correct sentences, and nobody ever teaches us. Okay, now I think of this learning process as the apprenticeship of the human experience. This, experience, this prepares us for life as a human being. Because we can reduce this learning process to a three-stage step of observe and devise. And this is the exact same process used to make all scientific discovery. I use the example of flight. George Cayley learned to flight by studying birds. He observed them. He spent sufficient time in preserving their behavior that he was able to infer the causes of flight. And then he and others learned how to devise machines to incorporate the laws of flight into it, and we flew. It happens over and over. It's a very rational process. And because this process is always observation, I say we're a model-dependent species. We can't get what we don't see. In language of all the possible languages, phonemes, words, grammar uh, structures, we'll only acquire the ones we get in our immediate environment. We will never get anything we are not physically exposed to. If our community misuses a word, or mispronounces a word, we will get that mispronunciation or misuse and we'll carry it forward. Physics does not have a sense of right or wrong. It only has a sense of what is. It's a physical process. Now I'm going to argue since we can see this process engaged in the first social system a child acquires language, and it's engaged at the height of human brilliance, scientific breakthrough, it's the process human beings use to acquire everything in between. This is how we learn our religion, the sports we play, our social customs, the music we sing, the way we dance, the foods we eat, the toast we give at weddings. And it's all done by the same rational process, observe and fur device. The point is, there is no inherited mechanical behavior to human beings. We may have inherited a natural aptitude and even a genius for music, but how we interpret that genius is absolutely dependent on what we discover in our environment when we start listening to music. We carry it forward from there. We may have a compulsion to dance, but when we first start dancing, we do the dances that we saw other people do. And then, with that drive kicks in to change the world, and we strive to do a different kind of dance. That's the way we move. Our first political views are sheer imitations, and they'll change if they don't work for us, as well as they did for those who were models for us. 
beyond the innate inherent capacities of brain power, everything that fills our brain gets there by the observant birth process. It's a strictly physical process. Yeah. So let's talk irrational behavior. Yeah. Technically, irrational behavior is behavior lacking a rational reason. But in general usage, we are talking about behavior acted out by someone else besides ourselves that threatens the stability of our world. It's contrary to our well-being. We are never irrational. Always someone else is irrational. Now, we may say, no, oh, I was irrational back then. But we're mistaken because we were always rational. We were acting in a way so as to achieve something we believed would improve our world. We were acting in our own best interest. Even if we threw a tantrum, to get what we wanted. Well, let me give you this example. Every year at the COP conference on climate, the air is filled with tension and charges of irrationality between two groups. First, there's the in group. This is the group inside the conference, and they are going to make decisions that are going to affect everyone else in the world. And outside that conference are a group of demonstrators, and they are not going to get a say in those decisions and they're out there trying to make those they're trying to get they've been to blocked access to those decision making processes but they're doing what they can to get their voices heard. so both groups charge each other with being irrational the group outside charges that the group inside is not admitting how perilous their decisions are toward the climate and to the people and are not making the hard choices necessary to stave off this problem, right? And the inside group charges the outward with being irrational because they're overhyping the problem, they're driven by fear rather than facts, and resorting to the childish behaviors of demonstration and interrupting and pro procedures as if that will ever change anything. Okay, so both groups are charging the other with their irrational behavior. Which one's irrational? And neither one is irrational. Because yes, if the in-group stays its course, the out-group will suffer. But the out-group's been stripped of power, and they can only do what they've been taught to do, but what they've observed by models you do when you have no power. They're protesting. The in-group is not irrational. They know damn well they're tearing up the planet. But the more they tear up the planet, the richer they get. And the richer they get, that is an expansion of their self-will and their self-interest. And it would be a violation of their self-will and self-interest to give up that cash cow. The planet may be in trouble, but they're telling themselves that there will be safe havens on this planet. And they, having the cash and the will and the interest, will be able to live in those safe havens. And as for the rest of us, they're saying, well, survival of the fittest. Suckers walk. <laughs> it's just a fact. You see, it's not a violation of physics to lie. It's a violation of physics not to act in self-interest. If you're acting to accomplish goals, you're rational. Let me ask you a question. Can you think of any models in history, on TV, in novels, in fiction, in the news, about where it's appropriate to kill other human beings as a way of changing social conditions? Where it's right to kill other people in order to make this world a better place to live in? Can it really be irrational then when somebody walks into a university and starts shooting up the place? And what they want to do is change the world. I'd love to go on to this, but I got more places to go because I want to tackle this subject of human purpose.
Up until the 20th century, mid 20th century, most people were unable to make rhyme or reason of the natural world. We never saw it as a system. We saw it as a bunch of chaos. We saw patterns. We saw birds come and leave and come back. We saw mushrooms come up in the spring. But we couldn't relate all this as one big gigantic system. We thought it was just all these things doing their own thing, acting out. We didn't see their interrelatedness. We found nature a very irrational place and thought that maybe they were just actually fighting with each other to survive. Now today, we understand nature to be a very complex and interrelated system of interdependent living and non-living things. These elements are not struggling so much as cooperating to build an environment that they're all dependent upon for their survival. And we can see this now because of the biologist's test of purpose. Using this test, biologists were able to draw the very specific mechanical map of who does what and how it affects who to explain this interrelatedness. They showed it to us, and now we all know it, and we all see this beautiful view of the world as being this magnificent, complex organism. They drew their map by establishing purposeful, purposeful behaviors of species. As that behavior, which when removed from the environment, set up ripple effects with negative repercussions beyond the species. It's a simple task to carry out. All you do is remove a species from an ecosystem, and you observe what effects that occur for having removed the species. You then return the species, and you see if it restores to normal or recovers. You repeat it until you have confidence. If you remove honeybees from the environment, they no longer pollinate. If they no longer pollinate, the first ripple effect is plants no longer fruit or produce viable seed. The lack of fruit endangers some species dependent on that fruit, no. which in turn endangers the species who are dependent on those other species. We see the ripples. Because we see the ripples, pollinating is the purposeful behavior of human beings. And I can tell you through study that test is not only valid for biological species, but for all physical objects. If you want to know the purpose of anything, return it, remove it from the object environment. Go into your kitchen, pick out a few things, throw them away, carry on your business as normal in the kitchen, cook what you would, do what you do, wait till you find out, wait till you run into that thing you need. See what ripple effects of soup and soup for not having that thing anymore. You will know immediately what its purpose is. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, after learning the biological test of purpose, I observed we are a biological species, and I said to myself, well, let's test us against this and see what results. My first problem was to how to remove us from the environment. Easy. <laughs> Fortunately, Einstein gave us the mental experiment, and I can adopt that technology. But to carry out this experiment required I study this test in detail. And here's a list of purposes or characteristics that can be identified as being associated with purposeful behavior. It's interspecies, never intraspecies. It's beneficial to the acting species. It's not optional. It's unique to the species. The species is uniquely suited for this purpose. It's universal to the species, so there may be roles within the species. It's continuous through the generations. Failure to perform sets up the negative repercussions. It has never been determined to be to survive or struggle to survive. And bearing young is never the purposeful behavior of the species. Just being fruitful and multiplying is never purposeful behavior. Sorry. Now, <clears throat> I don't have time to address the list in detail. 
But if you consider human purposes in relationship to this list, you will find that human purposes miss almost everyone. Every human purpose is not interspecies, but it's intraspecies. It's about gaining dominance over each other. What we claim is our purpose, one of the reasons we can't ever achieve it is because we're real fit for that. We don't have the capacities. We, we, we're, whatever we're supposed to do, you know, we don't have the brains, we don't have the spirit, we are evil, we, we can't be good, da 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 da. All we want to do in our purposes is be greater than our own members of our species, whether it be to be the part of the great race or to be the star on the stage. Now I approach this by looking at this list of characteristics and I try to identify those characters in us. What's unique about us? Brains and thumbs. What's universal towards our, to our species besides inward activities like fighting and eating, etc.? That was a question I couldn't answer for a long time. How about continuity of generations? Our behavior is so different generation to generation now, it's difficult to pick out any pattern. Again, other than eat, drink, and be merry. What do we do that our ancestors did? And what do we do outwardly that doesn't deliver a negative repercussion to our environment? In fact, it seems if we were to remove us from the environment, the environment so would benefit. Over time, I was able to fill in some of these answers, and I had to rethink. For one thing, one revision I had to make was I had to expand my understanding of what it means to fail to perform. On one hand, if you fail to perform your job, it's because you showed up for work and you didn't do it. Well, on the other hand, to fail to perform could be if you were at charge with the task of rebuilding the transmission, and when you got done, it didn't work. That's fail to perform. <laughs> so what is it we do that we can't help but do, and we can't seem to help but hurt ourselves in the process? That answer to that is technological process, progress. So bearing that in mind, think again about human influence on the earth in one small arena. How many varieties of apples, dogs, horses, pigs, ferns, trees, roses, grass, peaches, and tomatoes would not exist if it were not for human activity? We have actually amplified the variety of life on this planet in a many arenas. And what happens if we disappear? Well, in a few short generations, we'll have mangy dogs, scrawny tomatoes, razorbacks, a few common wild roses, etc. Without our organizing influence, all this, all these varieties would rush back to a state approaching neutrality. A low level of energy capable of surviving in a climate, climate of less than ideal less than ideal nutrition, they'd have more predators, etc. We need a right <laughs> Remove us and thousands and or millions of years of refinement would vanish. So our work in this area is not necessarily a bad thing. The other thing we've been advancing is mechanical technology. And now our mechanical technology is creeping into our biological manipulations and our biological manipulations are beginning to threaten us. The problem is we're never going to stop this drive technology. But these two have a commonality. They both relate to organizing matter, causing it to organize in configurations never before seen on this planet. We manipulate matter the same way we manipulate our alphabet and words, continually reorganizing the elements at hand to come up with something new and unique to this world things our ancestors would never be able to comprehend. And I argue this is human purpose, to organize matter. We're the inventors of the future variations of form on this planet. This is what we have the drive to do, the capacities to do, the skill to do. It's the continuous thing we've done through the generations, and it's how we act with the external world. 
when we do it well, it benefits the external world and us. When we do it poorly, it, 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 it's detrimental to the external world and us. And this is what we've been doing in every generation since we built the stone axe, learned to manage fire, figured out the wheel, learned to keep the best seed, best fruit for seed. We manipulate matter to reinvent the future. We change the world we live in to make it a place we prefer. And that's our purposeful role in this game. Every brain function we have is perfectly suited and necessary to this task of reorganizing matter. <coughs> that fits with that capacity on the list. To be physically suited for the job. Now every species on earth can manipulates matter and converts it from one form to another. But every other species is confined, so they don't have a choice over how they convert matter. Worms do to fallen trees what today what worms did to fallen trees a million years ago. We're the only species who can take a rubber tree and turn it into a tire, take grass and make a hat, take metal and turn it into a computer. Now, let me bring in some corroborating evidence to support my assertion. Think it this way. Spiders come into the world every year and set eating other bugs in the garden. Generation after generation, the spiders do the same thing year in, year out. They get here and the bugs look exactly alike, the same as they did 5,000 years, 100,000 years. The exact behavior of the child is the exact behavior of the parent. The parent didn't have to teach it because it's in the brain. The world is so consistent, the instructions are still good and valid after a million years. But look at the situation of human beings. Our situation is so different from our ancestors as to be unrecognizable. <coughs> Whether it's how we communicate, entertain ourselves, travel the world, children born to today's world is so different than the one their parents are born to. How would you pack a brain in advance with instruction on where to go and how to do, what to do, and how to do it? How do you tell a horse riding nation to suddenly start driving cars? <laughs> you don't. Now compound that with the fact there's no external management to what we, what, how we change the world. It's what we choose to do. How do you keep new generations current with that? I say you utilize an unfinished brain. You build one that has potential but no capacity. And because it forms after birth, every child then knows how to speak the language of their world and use the technology of their world. And they now have the functions in their brain to carry on the work of the species, which is to choose the future. You use an unfinished brain and you make the brain model dependent. What you see is what you get. And you would use it with the ability to observe, infer, and devise. You don't need a big memory. And you created a never-ending game with strict rules, but no need to manage those rules. Children are never confused by new technology, and they always find new ways to use it that the people who invented it never thought of. It's adults who have trouble with new technology. Children don't have trouble because their brains form on that technology. Adults have trouble because their brains are formed on a previous, now obsolete technology and they have to overwrite their brains. We haven't stolen fire from a garden and we haven't been kicked from the gods and we haven't been kicked out of a garden. We're not a genetic mistake with no purpose, struggling to survive. We've never evolved. The brain required 
to get the first computer was the exact same one required to get the first wheel. We've changed the world around us, but like the worms, we haven't changed a bit. Our only struggle to survive is intraspecies. We have no natural predators. We can eat a wide range of diets. We may have a frail physical body that we need to clothe and protect from the elements, but that does not mean we are ill-fit for this planet. We have the brain that enables us to organize matter, to clothe, feed, shelter us, help us avoid disease, and do so much more that is not simply about survival. Our survival problem is intraspecies. And if we solve that, we'll find this earth one very fine place to live in, perfectly suited for our kind. It'll prove to be a fantastic playground, absolutely perfect for the brains we have in our heads. It'll enable us to find contentment in our creativity temporarily, and then we'll want to change it all again. But really, we've got to get rid of the idea that we're the interloper. The pursued, the misbehaving, the punished, etc. And accept the ideas for the adults on this planet. We own it, we're free to do as we want with it, even if that means we spend all our time killing ourselves. I, I'm willing to promise you no one in this universe gives a damn what we're doing to each other any more than you care if the plant and the ants living in the hive beneath your kitchen are killing each other. So, I see our purpose is to organize matter. It's a physical purpose. It integrates us with the physical world. The feedback on the quality of our work is instantaneous, fairly instantaneous. Organizing matter is what you do every time you do anything. We reinvent the world to change our experience. We find no satisfaction doing the same thing we did year after year. None of us have to come into the world and do the exact same thing our parents did. We like stability, but somewhere in that, we want the new, the novel, the exciting. So here's back to the beginning. Our exploitation of technology is tearing up the world. Not because it's an evil thing we're doing, but because we have this warped social system. Where an individuals have such outsized power and will that they're able to personally benefit through this exploitation. The solution is not to curtail technology, but to restore the natural balance of self-will and self-interest. If we solve that problem, what we do with this power of ours will be naturally moderated. What we then do when we follow our instincts to manipulate matter will be beneficial, not detrimental, to our species and all the species who are mutually dependent on this planet. The natural moderator of the social system built in conformance, the natural moderator is the social system built in conformance with the physical principles of social organization. They work, they work everywhere around us, and they'll work for us, and we can't talk about it tonight. Again, these are the inherent characteristics of human beings that must be understood to exist if we're to build a successful social organization. And if you are a person who wants to solve the social problem, and you start working with these, you'll find something very interesting about these characteristics. Uh, you don't have to get people to agree to these or sign up to them or figure out how to make people be like this. You don't have to change people in the order to cause the world to change. You'll have a tremendous leg up on people who develop a plan but first have to change human nature to change the world. <laughs> All you have to do is accept these characteristics just as all we had to do to fly was accept the characteristics that were required of flight. All you do is figure out how to organize them. You don't have to vote, you don't have to enact laws, you don't have to get permission, you don't have to seek agreement. You simply cooperate with physical reality. 
What we will need to learn is how to create the environment required to defend or amplify these characteristics. And the recipe for doing it is the three principles of social organization physics. I hope it made sense, and that's my argument, and I guess it's your turn. No one has the first lucky question. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat that again at the first time? Are there any equivalent laws to social organization, to physics, to social organization, equivalent to the Newton's three laws of motion, or the law of conservation of energy? Well, is part of the body of physical laws. They are related. They act on matter. They are they, they organize matter, they organize energy. So yes, they're related. Oh, I'm sorry. I won't hold this. You've asked me if there's any relationship between Newton's three laws of motion and well, the law of physical laws, such as Newton's three laws of motion. Yes. Well, I would say they're in the same family. They describe the behavior of physical matter. Human beings are physical matter. Uh, matter, can you create no matter? I mean, the conservation of matter says so you can either create or destroy matter. Can you create, you know, it was obvious we could destroy uh, social matter. Well, I think the laws state you no gain of loss of energy, no gain of loss of matter. So I would say, nope. I, I don't. I, I really don't know how to answer the question. I, but I'd well, say, that's no. Surprising. Well, let's go on. Next question. All right. Uh, Bob Smith? Yeah. <clears throat> to what extent has your thinking been informed by the writings of Max Weber, the German sociologist? Never heard of him. You haven't? No. Max Weber, sociologist. He, he spoke of um, many of the same writings. Yeah. Right. Frank Avenuar, the Martin. I am amazed sure. how much time you talk, how much time you, you spend to say nothing. I mean, you, you're, you're, do you have you're, a question? You're, well, well I, wonder, question. I wonder, you, I wonder if you can condense <laughs> in a phrase what you're trying to say. Because, you know, we are looking for solutions, and you just come and give mumbo jumbo. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll answer that. You try to pay much attention to what you say, and, and where are you coming from? What, well, what the heck are you trying to say? I, I understand your uh, aggressiveness. <laughs> yeah, no, whatever. No, I don't. I understand your 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 wanting an instant answer, and we want an instant answer. Do you know how long it took to get flight uh, off the ground? It took a hundred years. Uh, you know how long it took to to move you know, the first are, idea. We are educated people, and we have some idea of where we want to go. And and you come pretending to say something, and you say nothing. Well, okay. Uh, I mean, anybody disagree with that? Yeah. I disagree strongly. I think oh, you've had a good okay. okay. purpose. You, you are you are really oh. exceptional. Uh, <laughs> that just means I'm smarter Margaret, than you sometimes. You sure, sure. Yeah, I would I'm like kidding. to know. Um, oh, a lot of things. Uh, I would like to know where you got your theory of learning, and and actually, it's kind of a two-part question. If you've ever heard of. Uh, Piaget and his um, theories of how children learn. Uh, the second part of the question is no, I've never heard that, and two, it's that I simply started asking for myself, without reference to what anybody else said, how learning is accomplished. 
I started, I started running physical experiments, meaning odd tests and odd go. I said, when I say mob dependent, anytime I hear somebody sit, act or behave, I always act, ask if I can find the model and if I can ever find behavior for which there's never a model. So that's how I determine things like that. Well, you did reference Noam Chomsky. I did. Yes, I did. Okay. Okay. I got my start from him, but other than that, I really haven't. Okay, I see Bob Matters have. <laughs> yeah. So, from what I'm gathering here is that you're advocating uh, uh, you know, like raising children to be some kind of uh, peace bots or something. Uh, I mean, you're. Am I, am I gathering this one? Am I right? Correct. Well, this what? what what's a peace spot? What's that? What's a peace spot? Well, let's say it. Let's say maybe a pacifist or something. You you want to train children, and you know when they grow up to not. I don't want to train children to do anything. To not uh, to not look at war as a solution to anything or something. Is that kind of what you're getting at here? Well, I would like to set the social structure that lets children look at the world and see that war is unnecessary and that there's other ways to do things. But I wouldn't want to go ingrain children with the idea that they can't, that they shouldn't use war. When everywhere around them, all they find is war. I'd be just, as they say, pissing up the rope. Doug Boucher? Yeah, uh, I'd like to ask a specific question of something that you had under characteristics of purposeful behavior? Sure. Uh, the last point you said in, in sequence, very young is never the purposeful behavior of the species. Now, that may be true that for not every member of the species, but at the same time, if we don't reproduce, uh, you're going to lose a species or it's going to become extinct, like the dodo birds. Okay. So, I, I don't know if you were, you, I don't think you were trying to promote the fact that no one should have sex. Nope. <laughs> no, no, but I was, the point is that the, the, the behavior is never interspecies, it's always interspecies. So, yes, if we don't have children, and we don't feed ourselves, and we don't clothe ourselves, we disappear, we can't express purpose, that's true of any species. So, what would you call it, a, pro a secondary pers uh, purpose, purposeful behavior? It's, but in the biologist's test of purpose, which is the standard I use because it's the one that works, the behavior, it's never the effect on the species, it's the effect on the world beyond the species. That's a question. Purposeful behavior is always that behavior which impacts not the species, but the species beyond the species that's acting. I hope that clarifies it. Uh, sounds like it's splitting hairs. No, no, it's not. It's a, it's a physical test. Andy, were you just waving or... All right, Tim. Okay, how does the importance of things like trade fit into your model? Trade. Trade as in commerce, as in money, as in exchange of ideas per species. Uh, it seems to be a, been around for a long time as a thing. How would you integrate this into your model? Or is it part of the model? Well... To get to that point, you have to have some. You have to de develop the understanding of the principles. Okay. You have to understand how we fit. You have to understand certain things. Then you go and you can use all this information to begin to address a trade model. Yes, you can. You can begin to build a potentially viable. You can begin to conceive a sustainable economy based on these principles. But you have to get. You have to understand the elements you're working with and what you're not working with. So that's one reason I spend so much time building foundation. You've got to have enough foundation to go to the next layer, which might be discussing, okay, what's an election process? That's or or uh, if you can have leaders, how are, you going to, how are you going to select them in such a way that it doesn't destroy the community? You can do it. You can use it. If you use these laws, you can do it. But if you're going to get there, you have to have a foundation to actually do that. If you want to build a successful 
economy, you can start looking at that too. Then you can examine trade from that standpoint. But my, I'm, I mean, I know it's slow and tedious, no. but you can't build except on the foundation you lay behind you. Yes, Charles? Yeah, Kurt, I noticed that at least 50% of your slideshow <coughs> Uh, concern the human brain and that's a field called physiological psychology which is hardly by and of itself an explanation of all of human activity I mean you brought in sociology there's social psychology there's culture yeah we just can't say the brain and then you know, it's certainly a pivotal organ, but not a determinant to what goes on in the world. I would say the human brain determines just about everything that happens on this planet. Other than what happened before we started tinkering, I would say it's been essential to everything that's happened. It's caught, it accounts for every change that's taken place on this planet. There is no other creature, there has never been since we got here. The record seems to indicate there's never been a new species put in an appearance through evolution. There's been change within species, but there's never been a new species. There's never been any change. The only change that has been wrought on this planet since we got here is the change that we brought. And we brought it by organizing matter. And we did it with this brain. And so I would say this brain's pivotal to everything that's happened on this planet. And so all just, the other variables are extraneous? What, what other variables? The environment? Well, we've been, we've been, everything yeah. we've modified is modified Just the environment. Group, my nuclear family, my relationships. That's much more important than the brain. Nuclear family, extended family, tribe. I'm not sure. Culture, country. What, what, what change has tribe brought on the... I think every, any change that came to the planet was through the brain. I'm not sure that what, what, what the tribe changed. My behavior, norm, moral, social mores, my belief system. But that, your belief system changed, that's a function of your brain. Uh, <laughs> 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 you don't adopt the value system of the society you're in. All right, Bruce. How much, how much free will, how, is that how, much, patient? how much of your brain do you think is mechanical and automatic and how much is actually thinking or self-determination? How much of my brain is automatic? <laughs> In other words, stimulus response where you don't have any choice. You have a, you have a thought of control, but you really don't have any control. It's one the response, of the next response. Okay. How much of that do you think is there and how much is actual... Uh, self-determination, actual, actual thinking, not automaticity. We have almost no instincts. Um, Very limited. There's a lot of activity in our brain that isn't it's just, we have a lot of we have on an autonomic responses in our brain. We do have those. They control a lot of things. We don't necessarily control our emotions. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a, uh, that's the nervous system. That's they are a consequence of interaction with our environment, though. We don't control them. So there's a lot of things we don't control, and there's a lot of activity <coughs> that we wouldn't think we are actually controlling. And I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that every action a human being makes is a conscious activity. But at the same time, any time we that, that there's a lot we do we we I mean I don't know how to put a number on it. I, I wouldn't do that. I I'm not going to say twenty percent or forty percent. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, sir. Uh, you can say anything about a concrete society, how the type of society that we have, class society, 
the terms are consciousness to a large degree, and struggling against that society also determines your consciousness to a large degree, and brings you to the point where you want to change things. Well, and that develops to the point where you have a higher level of consciousness, and that's how the brain develops, actually. It, 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 there's no end capacity to the brain. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, you're a, there's you're no finished brain like you talked about. That's impossible. The brain is unfinished when you're born. It's, it takes the physical brain. But there's no unfinished consciousness. Well, I don't know about consciousness. I just know about the physical brain. And that's the capacity to, a mature brain hits the body between 27 and 30 years. It takes that long for a human brain to mature. And during that time, the brain does mature. You're constantly learning, but the physical, the phys I'm talking about the physical capacity of the brain. Complete. It doesn't have no limits. I didn't say it had limits. It does have a physical, it does have a gestation period uh, up to about 27 to 30 years. How much time? But the, the capacity to learn, I mean, I still learn today. I agree with you. But my physical brain has all of its capacities in place about the time I'm going between 27 and 30. But 12-year-olds do not have complete brains. They don't have all the capacities of reason to them. Neither do 18-year-olds. Only when you get to about 27 to 30 do you have the, com the command of the spectrum of human capacities in the brain. Now, you can use them for the rest of your life. My, my capacity is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm 85. What are you talking about? <laughs> 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 Mine is shrinking. Mine is shrinking. All right. Here. So that's like, uh, hey, do you have a source for that record? Do <laughs> 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 you have a source for that number? 37 to 30? That's bullshit. One yeah. pull at a time, please. <laughs> I'll bring you that source <laughs> next time. I should, I should bring it. But. Are you aware of the fact that Noam Chomsky, upon whom you base part of your theory, was in uh, one of his major contributions to learning theory of language? was that the, that the human brain is hardwired, i.e. it is not something that is subject to experience, um, to, uh, it's something that's inherent in the brain structure itself to provide a pattern for, individual, for uh, growing uh, infants and children to learn language. And that was one of his major And I said every so child is, is, has the capacity to acquire language. That's hardwired. I agree with you. All right. Uh, well, <coughs> your position is that the animal brains are complete from the day of their born. Then that's true. Well, how do you explain uh, uh, we train animals to do certain things and uh, even socialize them for our pets? Okay. Uh, how if they're if they're fixed uh, as when they're born? with certain innate impulses. They have no more attached no morality to killing a, a cat doesn't attach any morality to killing a bird. I really think we're mixing two ideas here. One is the physical development of the brain, which animals are born with brains that do not physically develop after they get on Earth. Now, the ability to learn is a function of the brain. Just because the brain is done physically developing does not mean that brain doesn't have the ability to learn. It uses those capacities. The difference is the physical brain in all other species is complete, as whole, as big, as it will be the whole life of the animal. My horses are born with their brains complete. My, if I had a baby, that baby would have an unfinished human brain, and that brain would continue to build and grow and fill in for somewhere around 27 to 30 years. And I do have sources, and I, I don't have them with me, but I get my information. So, just because a brain is done building doesn't mean it. In fact, 
that's when it ha it's like building a car, you know? It's only when the car is built that it has the capacity to run down the road and do the things that a car does. And when it's incomplete, it can't do those things. But the, we're, I think we're mixing apples and oranges here because we're, talk, we're not saying that the brain's done thinking. It's got all of its programming. We're simply saying the physical structure is in place with which to think. But it doesn't grow at all physically. In other words, a kitten's brain is a cat's brain. I don't That's true. No increase in weight at all? That's true. Okay. You said that uh, we never evolved. Uh, wasn't there perhaps a time when our ancestors did not have a, uh, a developing brain over the period of a lifetime? He says, I'm a house. They did not have a brain developing over the period of a lifetime. You're saying that's, that this is the difference. Yeah, isn't that uh, a, a, a mark of evolution too? Um, right oh, you're right, I can't prove that. But I can prove, you know, I can say, if you think about the, the idea of a feat of genius, and you think about, for example, Einstein getting the theory of relativity, and that is, that's one hell of a feat for the human brain to pull off. Okay? Now, that happens, you've got to think about that in context of the situation at the time, the advance of physics up to that point, the ideas that were working, he's working in this uh, uh, patent office, he's studying all these ideas and his brain is forming around as he's gathering this information, he's putting it together and he comes up with this brilliant idea. It's a consequence of the world he's in. Go back to the first guy who pulls a wheel out of his hat. That I maintain, considering the environment he would have been in, would be a feat no less a genius than the one Einstein pulled off. But it was the, it was that feat in the context of the environment he lived in that he got a wheel. Now there, and, and it's just we see that over and over. You can't you to say that that's it would have required every mental capacity that Einstein required to get it. Is what I say. Einstein lived in an era of. Uh mathematical calculation. That's right. And uh, he was a patent uh, attorney. Uh, That's right. Uh, uh, patent patent studier, studier. Approver. Patent uh, clerk. Approver, right. Uh, so, so we did have uh, the uh, social context uh, to develop that uh, theory. What are you rambling on? All right. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, whether or not, Kirk, whether or not I'm ethical or unethical as an individual, does that have anything to do at all with my brain? Has everything to do with your brain. Well, you mean if it's bad true. people have bad brains? <laughs> no, it means you're acting in self-interest. You, you have made the calculation of what's going to serve your interests most. And you will choose ethics if you think it will serve you most. You will serve to be unethical if you think it will serve your own personal so all ethics yeah. is moral and that, how, all what? ethics is moral calculus? That's I'm sorry? Is. All ethics is moral calculus? If you want to call it that, I, it's, it's serving the self-interest. Is an altru altruistic act uh, calculate? I would, I would say, and I'll get, you know, if a person is behaving in a way that they believe it will change the world to a place that they would prefer to live in, it's calculated activity. And that is, even if they run off and, and decide to be a selfless person and serve the orphans so that they will receive a, a, a reward in heaven, they are not selfless. They are acting for the reward. They are acting out of self-interest. They want to change the world to make it the way that they think they want it, and they, they're using the method they think will work, and they are no different than the person who says, I want to get rich, and the way to get rich is to start a business, and they start a business. Both of them have an idea of what's important, and they're working to it, and they're using the methods they believe will work. They're both self-interested. We use morality 
to arbitrarily assign one as a, as a noble act and one as a selfish act, but they're both acts of self-interest. So Jesus um, had the best brain of all because he gave his life to the community. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I, I think it's very interesting, your, your whole presentation. Thank you. I think we got off on the wrong track. We were talking a lot about brain development. And really, what you really wanted to present, as far as I can understand, is a different model of understanding what, where human behavior, and we sort of basically have to recognize X, and then we will look at things differently, and we will do Y. And so my question, and you, you, to help us understand that, what was missing were really concrete examples. How would we do things differently if we accepted self-will and self-interest and getting rich is the same as helping the poor? If we thought like that, give us some concrete examples, because if you don't give any examples, then you're leaving yourself open someone saying that this is just gobbledygook and they don't, you just, you should give specific examples of what would be different, how would we be different? Because when we first came here, it was supposed, we, 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 heard the, we heard the word peace and all these things that would be different. So I'd just like to give, you, give us some, maybe I'm just, I don't have enough brain cells yet to figure out how, how, this, how this applies to real concrete. You're not 27. <laughs> For every example, well, though, there's a counterexample. Well, let me just hear what some of these real, so real world examples are. Exchange counterexamples all night? <laughs> <right. laughs> okay. Um, one of the problems you... I, I don't mean I, I'll go back to my beginning point. You've got to... If I came in here and started describing examples, you would say they were ludicrous. I didn't have any basis for putting them up. No, I okay. want to hear them. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making, I just want to make a point here. Well, but, and, and the point is, you can't do everything in one night. But, let's, what, what you like? You want to talk about how to elect a president? Uh, if that's what, if you can do that one, great. Yeah, but, I'll, okay. I'm in for it. Okay. You use these. They took my screen. Uh, it's okay. You can, we can refer to the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, refer to the handout. Yeah, we have a handout. We have a handout. So we can remove. Yeah. Okay, you've got the, you've got the handout. We have the handout. If you're going to solve this problem, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to stop this nonsense of offering excessive will and excessive power to one individual. Okay? Now, as long as you keep selecting a president on the basis you do, you're going to be handing all your will over them. I don't go vote because I will not surrender voluntarily my right to participate in community. They'll still take it from me when everyone else votes, but I'm not going to voluntarily surrender it. Okay, that's just very, that's just my attitude. I don't care who wins, it doesn't matter. The worst situation is going to be the same. I'm a loser. Fair enough. So I don't participate in, you know, they get to do it, I can't stop them. But I'm not going to be part of their game and sign off and sign off, sign away my rights. Okay, now, if you want to solve this problem of this, you have to figure out how not to have to do this. The reason and the way you do it is, you have a random selection among the community. And you've got three rules sitting up in front of you right now. To be president of the United States, you have to be what? 35 years of age. You have to be a, res a citizen of the United States. And you have to be a resident of this country for the last 10 years. Those rules are, you have no bigotry associated with them. They are physical rules you can measure people with. And if you want to solve this, the first thing you do is you say, we need a new president. And the first thing, we're, the second thing we're going to do is anybody who wants to be president follows the second law of the social organization physics, which means, which says, opportunities afforded, afforded on the basis of self-selection. So anybody who wants to be president meets those qualifications, throws her hat in the ring. There. Now you've got a tool of how many people who want that job. Right now you've got uh, 250 million people who want it because it's got such power and, and opportunity afforded with it. But fine, so let's say a million people pull in their names. How do you resolve who gets to be president? You pull a name out of a hat in the long run. 
Oh. Now you have a person who comes in the office. Now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You think, oh, how are we going to have an idiot run the country? We're going to end up with we're going to end up with with me running the country. But wait a minute. Think about that. Think about that. If you set somebody up like that, just just start running some mental experiments. If you pull that off, how many rules, how many law changes would be made instantly? to take power away from that person. You would have an instantaneous reaction. But you've now got a government run by the people. Anybody in the community. Streets work because everybody goes out there. Why can't anybody run the country? You'd start restructuring the country so that whatever idiot got in could run the country and it would be a safe place. You would change the laws to make it safe. But now you've got this belief you have to have these superior people in place and you have to trust them and they rob you blind. If you go the other way, you will set the rules. They won't rob you blind. And that's the first thing you happen. And then the decisions they make. And now, let's think about this. Ever, the reason people get into politics. Well, can I finish this? You can ask for my example. Or if I said Bob Matter. Uh, the successful social system here talks about uh, people achieving collectively what none can do individually and ensures that uh, members of the community mutually benefit in the fruits of cooperation. That sounds suspiciously like Marxism to me or communism. And, uh, and you know, haven't uh, we figured that one out by now that Self-interest is, is the mainspring of human motivation. We have about 55 million dead commies to uh, look at, to base that upon. Every every country that's tried it's had famines and poverty and misery. I tell you, I've, I've never uh, heard of an iPad or uh, anything like that coming out of North Korea or a, uh, uh, a new <laughs> What's going to make people work hard if they get no benefit out of it? Well, what makes every low-level employee of every company go to work every day? They don't get any. They they've got a fixed uh, refund or a fixed return. They don't have unending opportunity, but yet they go and they do their duty every day. I don't know that that's true, that what you're saying has any validity, because I observe people. They will contribute to their community, and they want to contribute to their community. And to, the problem with, with, with bringing up Marxism and North Korea and everything is because you're contrasting them to the United States and capitalism if there's some big difference. But one of the, diff there's one of the things that is not different about North Korea and it's not different about Marxism, is there was this, there's this espoused idea of equality, but there was no more equality in those environments than there is in this environment. Communism in all of its forms had a leadership. That leadership had control of the assets. That leadership made decisions with respect to the lives of its citizens, and it allocated the burdens to its citizens and the privilege to its own self. It acted in self-interest. So to say that there's some model there that failed is not... What failed was when they went to battle with another country on the same structure that just had a president instead of a czar. They lost. Now we write history and we say, yeah, see, they wanted equality and they died. But if you go back and you look at our, our Declaration of Independence, I believe we espouse that we are looking for equality and a peer-to-peer -peer relationship in our membership. And we want to share equally in the fruits of our labors. And we, this is what we're striving for. And yet when you bring it up, now you're a communist. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. What do you want? Leaping you on? Yeah, I just uh, when you say 
uh, everybody's decision and behavior is uh, based on the self-will, self-interest. That uh, including uh, the, those are all affected by say moral standard, cultural, and uh, they all included. So I just wonder, uh, do you have any uh, say what are the good moral or cultural we should promote as to, to bring more peaceful world, a better behavior, a good organization behavior? Do I have any ideas about how to promote peace? Sure. Well, how to rebuild the world according to these principles is the first one. But, yeah, you have to restore the state where will and interest are distributed across the community. When you do that, nobody has a leg up on anyone else. You'll find that people cooperate. People have always, every society that was ever formed, every group that ever got together, the basis was, we're going to get together and we're going to cooperate to achieve something we haven't been able to achieve before and we're going to all work together, one for all and all for one. Everybody wants to do that. You're not going to have a lack of cooperation when you give self-will and self-interest back. You're going to have cooperation. What you're going to have, though, is you're going to, it's going to be moderated so that people can't destroy each other they won't have the power. And I don't know if you can understand that, but it's put it like this. You have, an airplane requires all these forces to be acting at one time. You have to have lift, you have to propulsion, you have to have gravity. Okay. So, you, okay, uh, maybe just uh, based on what you just said, uh, uh, your idea basically it's a democratic system. So everybody has their, uh, can express, can exercise their will and their, their interest equally? Or Absolutely. Now, not everybody can speak on every idea. But if you have a random selection of choosing who gets to speak on every idea, you're not going to have the same people speaking every time on the same ideas. And they're not going to be able to speak their ideas over and over and over again while nobody else gets to speak their ideas. Now, if you have a conversation where nobody can control the conversation, you don't know what's going to happen. But you're going to hear the, the diverse ideas of the community. And now you're going to have a valid, you're going to have a spectrum of information to choose from. You're not going to, every time you have a conversation, hear the same three people saying, oh, you know, it's because of the market and you have to be, blah, 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 blah. You're going to have everybody, you're going to have a series of ideas and you're going to have to, you're going to, have to, you're going to now hear these voices and you're going to take that information into account. Nobody has the ability to control the conversation. Rebuttals. Bob looked at Bert. Thank you, Henry. Um, you, you want to use physics, you said, to explain human nature and social organization. There, I didn't see you using much physics whatsoever, but I don't see how uh, Physics is a good approach to humans whatsoever. It seems to me very narrow. And you've only got facts about humans. And what's that, what, you know, what do you do with those? Like in the previous question. So isn't this a very narrow perspective because you leave out most of humans. You leave out the most important elements of humans uh, if they can't be physically proven somehow. I, I didn't see a clue of how you did that. You leave out all human values. You leave out all art. You leave out <clears throat> the spiritual nature of humans. You might scoff at that, but uh, uh, I think there is a big part of humans. I believe there is a realm of intangibles. And for example, uh, uh, one intangible is the rules of logic, which I don't think uh, <clears throat> your argument follows at all. Because how, uh, how could you argue such absurd um, ideas as Adams have self-will? Are you serious about that? Uh, and uh, <laughs> professional behavior is always done by others. Argument. And then murdering people at schools is rational. You know, and, and don't you have a very, then that humans are only matter, isn't that a very um, 
small perspective on humans. Okay. In the universe, there are only two things that physicists recognize, matter and energy. And if you study matter and energy, you understand that the only way you get energy, controlled energy, is through the organization of matter. From the physical, you get the energy. And if you want to understand the difference between matter and energy, it's very simply, if you can touch it, you can see it, you can feel it, feel it, you can store it in a jar, you can go to the hardware store and buy it, you've got matter. And if you organize that matter and you put it together and you cause a reaction out of it that it changes the system you've got in front of you, you've got energy. Thus, you can go to the, the store and you can buy the lawnmower and you get the gas and you bring it home and you put, you now have a pile of matter. You pull the cord, you get it going, you've got energy expressed. Matter and energy. Now, when I go to the, when I go, and when I die, you will boil me down to a bunch of atoms. And you will find nothing in this body that you can count except for stuff that you find on the periodic chart, the 95 atoms. What you won't find is my will, you won't find my sense of self-interest, my ability to account, my ability to love, my ability to, to, to feel fear. You won't find those things. They do. You don't show where I come from because you can't measure them. The, but the point is, I'm arguing to you that they are the consequence of the organization of matter, the 95 elements, because, because when I die, they disappear, and all you've got is the inert piles of matter. We're, I'm just telling you how I come to it. I say that anything you express that you cannot physically touch is an expression of energy, and it comes as a result of the organization of atomic matter, whether or not you can identify it or not. So that's where I, that's where I get my basic foundation. So I'm talking about, when I talk about these things tonight, I am talking about principal forces of physics. Even though I didn't go into this, Everything I talked about is a principal force of physics, the ability to calculate. It's a consequence of the organization of matter. Now you can say there's something that I can't see that makes it explain it, but I'll say it's something that I can see that makes it explain it. I will follow what happened and every bit of evidence I can find in the world. My question is mothers Louder, Brown. become a very, very close to their children and they will make great sacrifices for their children. Uh, parents, uh, uh, fathers as well. And, and Odds of other siblings sometimes you know, sacrifices for for other members of their family. Self interest is superseded by an interest in the other. Uh, this this uh, this continues uh, to uh, sacrifices for your community. People risk their lives uh, both in war and in uh, fighting fires and so on to preserve their communities. All right? Uh, don't we learn something more than self interest? How big is self? Some people have very small view of self. Other people have very large view of self. If you, wherever you view yourself, you will act in the best interest of that self. I see, but that that uh, doesn't change the definition of self. It's a it's an arbitrary decision that every human being makes, but every person will act in on best interest of self. That's if libertarian they, they bullshit. That's libertarian bullshit. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> that is. That's total libertarian, Ayn Rand, selfishness, bullshit. 
I'm not sex. And it's not an I explanation not... of human behavior at all. It's Anne Rand's crap. What? <laughs> And you know it is. I think Ayn Rand is crap too. There's also but I haven't said altruism. anything that says Ayn Rand had the right, right idea. They can't explain in evolution why there is altruism. All right, Charlie Rebuttal. All right, Charlie Rebuttal later. Right, Charlie, later. Okay. Why does the little bird It is now 10 o'clock. Let's get three bottles. Let's get two rebuttals. Rebuttals, rebuttals. Let's take it. Let's get Yay. Right, and soon you're already seated there. One, two, three, four, you guys five, got to say. Six, 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 six
And you could read a very good book on that called Ancient Society by Lewis Henry Morgan that goes into that quite a bit and how the Indians got along with one another until the white man came. There was no war amongst them except when the white man came, except for certain uh, parts of Indian society that were more advanced. Then there was war amongst them. And then we had slavery, and slavery was very bad, but it developed something at the same time because it allowed people to develop their intellectual capacity. You had philosophers, you had primitive scientists like uh, Heraclitus that said, if you walk, you can't walk through a body of water twice because there's constant change. So under, under slavery, we developed some capacity to uh, also develop agriculture and also develop uh, husbandry. So we're able to produce more food under the system than we were under primitive communism. So that was an advance in society, which also, uh, it's also improved an advance in consciousness because they're able to experiment with different forms of agriculture, different forms of uh, husbandry. So we got an advance over the previous method. And then we had feudalism, which is an advance over uh, slavery because we had a further advance in society uh, under feudalism. And then we had capitalism. And capitalism developed our industrial capacity. So we were able to feed the world even though we have a system that is based on exploitation. But we're still able to feed the world if some people control the food. And also we got a type of uh, philosophy of individualism. And that's what he's talking about to a large degree. This individualism. Now, individualism doesn't take into account the development of industry. Because when you go in to a factory, you're not producing individually. You're producing in mass. People come together. And it's a social form of production which is a higher form of production. So that advanced society. Also, we have uh, different philosophers. We have scientists. We have chemists. We have engineers. So that develops a higher form of consciousness. So the brain is always developing, always advancing. And industry is always advancing. But now we come to the point where we're hindering progress under capitalism because we're polluting, we're changing the climate, we're, constant, we're in constant war over uh, raw materials, markets, and super profits. And so this is a type of system that eventually has to end. And when it ends, and we tried to end it under the Soviet Union, but they made so many mistakes because it was the first form of socialism as it was an experiment, but we learned from that. And now China is developing and bringing its people out of poverty. Where in capitalism, what's happening in the United States, we're putting people into poverty. So the system has to change. And then if we could change the system, we'll also get a higher level of consciousness where people will work together for the good of everyone, not just a few individuals, the 1%, to have all this wealth. So in order to change consciousness, we have to change society. In order to change society, you need people coming together and struggling. In the struggle, they, they develop a higher level of consciousness. In other words, a group consciousness that we basically all have the same interest, to live a better life. And what he talked about was just a bunch of rubbish. That's <laughs> 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 Okay. Uh,
uh, a new version of uh, Buddhist uh, meeting. Uh, this is my sec third time here, but the uh, first time come to here to speak. Uh, I like the topic, uh, but I think there's a fundamental weakness. It's uh, the physics. You talk using the physics uh, ideas to explain what the world uh, will be changed to words or something. Physics, by definition, it doesn't change. It's uh, all the physics laws that doesn't change in, in uh, through time. However, our environment, our s cultural, our society changes uh, dramatically and uh, faster and faster uh, nowadays. So uh, I think uh, we we may have to look at into uh, uh, in additional approaches. Although the physics uh, allow us to say. Uh, there is a possibility to be peaceful, to have a peaceful world, and uh, people behave rationally. Uh, but we also have to, from other point of view, how this world uh, is changing, and uh, how we adapt to the world, and uh, how to we behave. Uh, our behavior uh, needs to be changed in order to be a more civil world uh, for, for us and for our children. Uh, I will give a presentation in, on September 29th. Uh, my topic was, uh, uh, is uh, from the successful of modern democracy to see our future. Basically, uh, I would like to explore why uh, monarchies disappeared nowadays. It used to be all over the world. Monarchy in the Western world, in China, in all over the world is a, a kind of monarchy system, well developed. But nowadays uh, they are either symbolic or totally disappeared. And uh, why? Why it happens? And uh, democracy we have uh, democracy ideas uh, all over the world since thousands years ago in Greece and uh, in other parts of the world. If you look at the Wikipedia, it's all there. Uh, but the successful, sustainable democracy cannot, did not, uh, did not exist until about. 200, 300 years uh, in this country. So what happened? Why it changed? And uh, since then, almost the whole world is moving this way, uh, democracy. And uh, what's the fundamental change in there? And uh, I would like to discuss with you. And uh, if you want more information, maybe a few sentences here. And uh, then we can more detail in September 29th. All right. All right. Let's go with it. Uh, interesting tonight on our speaker. First, I'd like to thank him very much. I thought his presentation, although I didn't agree with a lot of it, was very well outlined and organized in the fact that he was trying to outline his premise for what he thought the world would be in the principles that he is basing human behavior on. And the first thing that came to my mind was Adam Smith. An enlightened self-interest and the basis of modern capitalism. See, to me, people cooperate when they have a little bit of enlightened self-interest to do so. And that started with the development of what I call trade. You had a little bit of something I needed, they had something that we needed, we exchanged, and the time and the behaviors of trade go back immemorially, all the way back to uh, even before civilization even got started. Why is it that people would risk their lives to go hundreds and hundreds of miles to you know, trade copper for grain, for example? Or why uh, people would undergo such arduous journeys, they get it for gain in their own self-interest and enlightenment. 
and the mechanisms for it have made that very system easier to deal with. However, it's also within their enlightened self-interest to take power and accumulate it and step on the rights of others, which basically means that sometimes the system does run amok, which basically means that the system does tend to, tend to move into a situation of uh, not flux. Recently, I do believe, though, that uh, I also recognize a little bit of some of the libertarian ideas in your speech, those of Ayn Rand and John Galton, enlightened self-interest as well. Who's John Galton? Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> I will say though, the one thing that I will say though about your, your presentation tonight is that it was very coherent, very enjoyable to listen to, and that if you paid attention to it, he was all trying to very much outline his basic principles on what he believed, and I thought he did a pretty thorough good job in explaining his views. I personally would like to applaud the speaker tonight for really trying his best to convey these ideas. Thank you very much. Is your, is your sweatshop in the best interest of the children? Charlie, a sweatshop well, is a step. And a, 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 no, Charlie, a sweatshop is a step for economic development. They, they are better off from the field. They're better off from the fields than they are from the things. We got to get the speaker involved now. Why don't you work in one? That's fine. I'll start my time right now. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to. I, I would like to thank the speaker. I mean, he's got a lot of nerve coming up and presenting this. Um, I, I think uh, I don't know if anybody knows Ronnie Drance, but uh, one of her statements is that she said, "Don't." Kid and in terms of his statement about how there's no purposeful behavior in um, in, uh, in, uh, in in procreation, I guess, in um, bearing young, there's it's not a purposeful behavior. She said, "Don't kid yourself. We're all just bags of gametes running around trying to make whoopee with another bag of gametes, and that's oh. the sole purpose in our life." And, tr and truly it is, and, and if you really uh, look at it very dispassionately. Um, at any rate, okay, so um, this was definitely a, a, a presentation in search of a basis. And um, I think that, um, first of all, it was very confusing, very muddled, and not very clear thinking. You confused. Uh, social behavior with atoms which do not have social behavior. It's almost like the atoms had a consciousness that they were looking for self-interest and that of course is, is there's no physical scientist in this world that's going to say anything at all about the self-interest of atoms. Um, the, the, uh, you were totally confusing things, the, the, the mark of, of really I, you know, I was the, the mark of a really great thinker is that you understand the theorists who have gone on before you, which is what Einstein did. He always said that he stood on the shoulders of the people who came before him. But um, our speaker really uh, betrayed absolutely ignorance in terms of who, what, what thinkers went before him. He misrepresented the uh, theories of Noam Chomsky. He did not know any names of people who had base, who were like the basis of theories of human learning, like Jean Piaget, um, and um, and and is, are accepted as as the ba as the basic theorists of, of how people, how children learn. Uh, Piaget, in fact, observed his own children and came up with with these these theories of stage development uh, of uh, or, or of stages of development, which was reflected in in other um, theorists. Um, and, and this constant confusing of physical and social. Now, I am of the opinion that, like you, that, that you know, or, or even that you said, that you can take the behavior of atoms and, and ultimately, because of the way atoms interact and they form elements, and the elements uh, form compounds, and then the compounds ultimately form amino acids, and then we have the beginning of life, and, and then the complexities of life and the fact that we have a brain developed. 
and all of that um, can, can really kind of a lot of ways be explained by physical things. But that was even confused in the presentation in that a, a lot of the stuff is not up to date in terms of brain, brain theory and, and, and uh, cognitive theory. Uh, or, or just the physiology, the neurophysiology behind uh, what happens in the body. Because really it's a unitary thing. The, the neurotransmitters that the brain uses to communicate between neurons, not just in the central nervous system, but also in the peripheral nervous system that allow me to do this with my uh, finger and hit the top of my head with it, more or less. Um, also, the neurotransmitters are active within tissues and within organs. And so it's not really like this is the brain and it's totally isolated from the rest of the body. That's not what goes on. Um, and that animals don't have developed. I mean, if you look at the primates, or particularly the, the humanoid uh, primates, so the chimpanzees and the bonobos and the, and the orangutans and gorillas, the, the um, infant brain um, and, and they're dependent, they're very dependent on, on their mothers for um, less time than um, human infants are. But um, they are very dependent. Or look at a kangaroo for Pete's sakes. I mean, a kangaroo is born like this big and it crawls up from the vagina, up the mother's belly, and crawls into the pouch if it's lucky, and then attaches and develops from there. So, um, you know, that period of dependency. Although that's not because of the size of the brain, that's just because it's a marsupial and that's the way it develops. But um, the size of the brain uh, or development of the brain is very similar. We're not different than the than the gorillas and the monkeys and the bonobos and that. It's like monkeys. In uh, that uh, aspect, I mean, the the brain is less developed as a, as an embryo developing fetus and embryo and or embryo fetus and then infant and then it develops as the animal matures and so you don't have, uh, for example, chimpanzees ready to mate or, you know, where you would have a, a developed brain and, and uh, animals developed enough to take care of uh, offspring until, you know, it's five or six years old or even seven or eight years old. I don't, I don't remember what the maturation thing is for um, chimpanzees. But it's, it's a brain development. Uh, it's a function of brain development among other things. So, um, so it was really sort of uh, one of the things I was talking about, you know, you, t you, you learn what it is you're going to talk about, learn what other people have thought about it, and uh, learn a lot of other, learn the things around it, and then you put that together and then put your own thoughts on top of it, and then you come up, you can come up with something more coherent than what was presented tonight. Now, I do have to say, that again, you have a lot of guts to come up here and talk about it. And, uh, but it, it truly wasn't well organized, it wasn't clear, it was all muddled, it was all mixed up, it was physical and all kinds of things all mushed up together where you really couldn't make much sense out of it. sort of agree with Margaret that uh, it was a little confusing and not very straightforward when you consider the handouts we were given and all the comments that you made uh, during the presentation there were some gaps and I was always making notes along the way uh, from uh, what was written up in, in the, uh, <clears throat> the flyer for advertising for tonight the essentials of physics of humanity uh, I just want to share with you the na nature of the social system in which human beings are organized is fixed, universal, immutable, and predictable, uh, as are the qualities of uh, the actions of honeybees. We can predictably organize ourselves into a robust cooperative community that does not break down into war and social crisis. Well, uh, I think it would have been better if you try to, to summarize and maybe when you uh, get up to make your rebuttal comments you could help us uh, figure out how your talk tonight ties in with what was on the uh, uh, flyer for advertising your talk. Uh, some of the things I just want to comment on, um, you know, it seems like you, you stated uh, kind of in a way in several places that self-interest and will or interest and will are What's driving uh, systems? Um, 
you uh, in, uh, in, you highlighted traffic systems as being successful systems uh, of interest and will, but at the same time, it, it, believe it or not, the traffic system is evol an evolving system. Uh, no, that was mine. Yes. I'm sorry. I don't know uh, if any of you remember, uh, but uh, you know, on the outer drive right now, uh, the drive is continuous uh, when you pass Michigan Avenue. You know, and Michigan Avenue traffic comes under the drive and over. Well, when my father uh, was driving in Chicago, 1960. He had an accident because at that time, the Michigan Avenue traffic poured directly out onto the outer drive. And I'm sure there were a number of accidents where you're driving down the outer drive at 40 miles an hour and you hit the stoplight and you have to go from 40 to zero in a matter of uh, minutes or seconds even. And, uh, and that's in bumper to bumper traffic. So, uh, you know, uh, they, people complained and there were a lot of accidents and the city took action. So. Uh, in that sense, you know, these things aren't always given, and even uh, the rules of the road and highway driving, they gradually evolved over time because I'm sure uh, there were drivers that uh, had their brakes on and were passing people on hills that caused accidents. So, uh, <coughs> some other things I want to comment on is the, uh, the, rules the fact of the, uh, you know, you were saying something about uh, kings and presidents and people uh, have to accept their kings and presidents. That's not true. Uh, we've had revolutions. We had the incidents in uh, France in 1789 where they threw their king out of office and beheaded him. And we had the situation in America where we had the revolution and we turned our backs on the King of England, George III at the time. What about the Pope? <laughs> so, uh, the thing, the thing is, uh, is that, you know, even in political parties, you know, uh, we, we have a, a, not a pure democracy where everyone goes to Washington and votes on issues. Uh, we have a republic of representation where we send representatives there. And even our president is really weak compared to all the members of Congress, uh, the Senate and the House. Uh, he has some veto uh, powers, but the Congress can't override his veto by a two-thirds vote. So, uh, in regards to people, uh, there are, uh, I'm surprised that you said that you did not vote. It's a shame because you, I think every American should vote in this system uh, because it's important. I mean, it's a very hard process. You know, the, they have preliminaries, uh, primaries to select candidates to run for the offices. And uh, we have parties, and you don't like the Republicans or the Democrats, you can join the independent voters. <laughs> Charlie over there is one of them. At any rate, uh, so that's something to consider. The other thing I, I really disagree with is you calling the human brain unfinished. I prefer, I wrote this in, underutilized. And uh, I, I think in a way that I've heard, I remember in high school they were saying we only use 60% of our mental capacity. And the other thing uh, is, is in regards to children and language, uh, you said that uh, we acquire language from the people around us. But I was thinking of a bilingual child and at home water is agua. And when he goes to school, they talk about water. So. You know, now he's got to keep two sets of languages uh, in his brain. Uh, the other thing is, you, you know, you talked about in uh, terms of learning. We can't uh, develop what we can't see. That's not true because a lot of times uh, we have, uh, you know, the, the automobile came about. Granted, we had carriages, but then they had to figure out how to get them a motor in and various other parts of, you know, power brakes and lights. And there was one time they used to have the gear shift on the outside and they had to bring it in and windshield wipers and all that, and the windshield. So, you know, a lot of things uh, had to uh, be developed. And I was even thinking of the cell phones. When the cell phones came out, uh, the only thing they had in mind was what they used in uh, uh, Star Trek, the little phones. And the original phones kind of looked like that. And then they eventually provided, uh, developed them into other models. So, uh, a lot of times and there's computers and Xerox machines that you just it's, Bob is going to give a talk on uh, 
this Friday about imagination, which is you know, something you don't even uh, have there. You have devised, but I'm not sure what you mean by devised. And, uh, and the, uh, the other thing is, is, you said irrational behavior is carried out by okay. others and well-being, I say, I have to say, in the established world. Though. Is that my time? Yes. Okay. Thank you. What is the relevance of rules that are road to all this? Dan Weinberg. My name is Dan Weinberg. Uh, the speech was very organized in a disorganized way. I think. Like Margaret was saying. You had no basis, you had no philosophy, you didn't mention Freud or Marx or any historians. This was just a bunch of blah blah, as my father would say. But it was nice blah blah. <laughs> so you, you say that the, the street is a good philosophy. You see people walk across the street when it says walk, People, you know, cars stop when the red light, and they go when it's the green light. That's that's your pinnacle of society. Society. Well, I say bullshit. <laughs> people, pe cars run into other cars. Cars hit pedestrians and kill them. Now, what kind of society are you going to have with cars killing people? With cars running into other cars and bumpers falling off, and then you got to go to the car repair shop down the street. I mean, the society is it's going to burn in hell, I guess. <laughs> so that has nothing to do with democracy or Republicans or <laughs> kings or queens or whatever. Oh yes, people people had brains. They've had brains for a couple of years. <laughs> so they created great works of art, like Leonardo da Vinci. He had a, something called the Mona Lisa. It's in a museum, right? Now, he had a brain, right? So this brain created the Mona Lisa. There's a, a bean down in the Millennium Park, a big silver thing. Chicago's now, kidney brain, stone. Huh? Chicago's kidney stone. Yeah, so what brain thought of that? I mean, where, where is that in your <laughs> philosophy? I, I don't know. I don't think, I don't know if it has a place. Uh, Picasso did a painting called Guernica. It shows the bombing in Spain, 1937. It shows cows flying in the air and people blowing up all different parts. Where is that in your philosophy? Uh, language. Language is words from my brain to my mouth and it comes out. So, so, so what about this? Uh, a little kid, he's on the beach and he comes up to the lifeguard and he says, I lost my parents, I can't find them. And the, the lifeguard says, there's so many places they could hide. Huh. You know, now where is that in your philosophy? That's all, thank you. Uh, my name is Andy Anderson. For those of you that might not have seen me give a speech here before or know what I do, uh, the hobby I have is that I collect and translate books to one-page cliff notes that somebody can read in five minutes. Here's two. One of them is called The Official Stories, written by Liam Sheff. He's got uh, about 
about 10 chapters on like the official story of what we were told about JFK versus what really happened, the assassination. This, this is uh, 2012, both of these are recent. Uh, the Betrayal of the American Dream, written by Donald <coughs> Bartlett and James B. Steele. Uh, Bartlett and Steele are two of our invest investigative reporters. They've been uh, writing stuff on what's happening in America for the last 40 years or so. One of their classics was Who Stole the American Dream, uh, written in 1992. Anyway, um, I've given presentations based on uh, summaries of large databases of reality rather than unsubstantiated opinion. So I can understand how it's a correct assessment saying you have a lot of nerve coming here giving a speech before the college here with people that have no idea what you're talking about, but they'll get up here and criticize you. I mean, because I've seen it for five years. We have people in this room that are very, very knowledgeable on certain subjects, but they are terrifyingly ignorant about the subject that somebody else is talking about, but yet they'll get up here and say, you're full of shit. So, Hang in there. I think you did a good job tonight. Um, I'll try to fill in a couple of gaps that haven't been, uh, comments that haven't been made by anybody else so far. Albert Einstein talked about the race between education and extinction. Humanity's in a race, and he didn't know who was winning. Uh, Tom Hartman talks about altruism being spread through the animal kingdom along not just uh, an attribute that uh, people have. Uh, William Rivers Pitt wrote a book called The Greatest Sedition is Silence, published about 10 years ago. And since then, hundreds of others have said the same thing. We get the government that we're able to put up with. And that is to say, we have smoke-free restaurants now because we reach critical mass as a body of people have said, that's no longer acceptable to be coughing and wheezing on somebody else's cigarettes. The Mayans prophesied that we would have a quickening of events, both good and bad, leading up to the junction of one cycle of time ending on December 21st. And as far as I can see over the last few years, they nailed the time frame exactly right. The election coming up is by all accounts the most pivotal election in the history of this country. It's, this election is the most clearest choice Americans ever had, have ever had between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. But it's portrayed as a 50-50 Democrat-Republican split, when really it's a question of, are we gonna just turn the country over to 100% corporate criminals, masquerading as our elected politicians? That's a choice we have. The American president, uh, the movie, there was a, a one spot in there when Michael Douglas says, America has some serious problems and it calls now for serious people to stand up and address these things. And uh, I don't know how many websites on the internet are saying the same thing. All of, thousands of different groups all over the world saying, it's time that we stand up and face the reality of where we are and take appropriate action. Uh, the gap at the North Pole, uh, the, the summer ice melt, that is uh, how much ice is not refreezing, that hole is getting bigger. And the latest studies that just came out said burning fossil fuel at the rate we're doing for the next 16 years will push us past the tipping point where uh, it won't matter what we do because the permafrost in Siberia is going to melt and the sea level is going to rise about 20 feet. Uh, the little kids that are here now, what kind of planet they're going to be living on when they're our age is going to be determined by what the grandparents do now. We don't just pass away and let the kids solve the problems. They don't have a snowball's chance in solving the problems if we don't get moving you know, now, the next year, two, three. The last, uh, I'd like to say one other thing. This election coming up, if the people under, wherever people understand what's happening, it would be 98% to 
So it shows that Americans are living in a total bubble <coughs> of media-generated ignorance. And you can find out what's going on if you log on to internet websites that post actual real truth day by day mm -hmm. rather than the media-generated mythology we get on mainstream news. I have cards of websites. If anybody wants one, come see me at the end. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank uh, our speaker again for coming back and being a punching bag for the College of Complexes. Uh, he is a good speaker. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's got good uh, diction and voice control. He's well prepared and all that. However, I think when, uh, when you scrape away the whipped cream and the sprinkles and the cherry, what you get, what you get underneath all that is basically... Marxist pacifism. Again. <laughs> Distrust of, of the profit motive, uh, you know, the suspicion of, uh, or maybe lack knowledge of, of, you know, like Tim Bolger said, of uh, Adam Smith's, uh, you know, uh, theories, or well, not really theories, but his observations of the truth, of natural truth, uh, that we all do, uh, you know, work for our own self-interest yes. and, and it's uh, you know we cooperate with each other for our self-interest that's where the cooperation comes from we don't need any you know state control to enforce that or any <coughs> social you know training and all that we just you know that's what we do you want to you want to be uh, you know you want to have a roof over your head and uh, food to eat you know then you better produce a a good quality product, you know, on time at a good price for your customers, yeah, and uh, and that's and that's what does it. These people that go to work in the factories, all the, the minions, he thinks, well, well, they don't have any uh, opportunity or, or for growth or anything. Well, that well, that's not true. A lot of those people going into to work those mundane jobs do have a uh, a goal of, or you know think you know they're trying to work hard to get promotions and and go on up and. Uh, but if nothing else, though, you know, they're, they're getting that paycheck and they're putting, uh, you know, food in their stomachs and maybe keeping a roof over their head, hopefully. And uh, uh, so they are, you know, again, it's, you know, it's, it's for their own self-interest. Uh, and they're, you know, and also, you, you know, you're learning things that you can take with you. You know, big uh, criticism of business people have had about employees is that, you know, you hire them and you train them and then five years later they quit and they become your competitors and uh, so it's not like you know oh you know this this master it's not a master slave relationship like Charlie tries to pretend it is and I actually can tell you a situation you can see it you can observe this yourself in Chicago rapid transit cycle shop 1900 West North a fine bicycle shop and they have another one on the south side on Halstead down there by uh, over by uh, UIC, but uh, they had a fine mechanic there named uh, Kevin Womack, who worked there for years and worked on my bike a number of times I brought it in there. And you know what? He quit and he opened up his own bike shop, Boulevard Bikes in Logan Square, mm -hmm. which is now thriving. And he has several employees. And, uh, you know, Charlie would have you believe that, you know, he was an exploited worker, you know, because he wasn't making as much money as the CEO, as the boss, you know. But now, now guess what? He's probably making as much money as uh, his old boss was, or maybe, maybe even more, so. Yeah, that up. Anyway, uh, and by the way, I don't know, you don't know the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, I don't think, because you've got this idea that somehow in those documents that it says that we all have a right to an equal share of the world, of the earth, or of other people's work or something. That's not true. Equal is only mentioned a couple times in both documents, and... Uh, in, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, it just says all men are created equal. It doesn't say we all get an equal share or anything like that. Or Charlie has a claim on my productive, my production. It just says we're, we're all you know, created equal. And the only time equal is mentioned in the Constitution is when they're talking about equal protection under the law, right? Or uh, if they're, when they're talking about um, mechanical things like, you know, you, you know 
you know, if you need an equal number of votes to do this or do that. But nothing, uh, nothing in there about, you know, everybody gets, uh, you know, equal shares of the pie or anything like that. Um, I, suppose if you, I suppose everybody here has seen 2001, A Space Odyssey, in which in the opening 16 minutes, an ape picks up a bone and he kills another ape. They're fighting over the water hole. And he picks up that bone, boom, and he kills another, and he throws it up in the air and it spins around and becomes a spaceship. And now I just think we went from that, from an ape picking up a bone, killing another ape over a water hole, to landing curiosity on the Mar on Mars. Now that is all done, that whole business of the flight, that was all for war purposes. And it proves Heraclitus was right when he said war is the father of all things. <laughs> And uh, <coughs> oh, I, got, I, I want to talk about the, the best social system that I think we've had is probably the Indians. And I saw this quote on the internet from from a guy from from an. Well, just let me finish this quote, Charles or uh, Brown. Uh, this Indian chief named Two Eagles. Wait, let me check my own stopwatch. Okay, you're right. Uh, this, this Indian Two Eagles said. No rent, no taxes, no debt, much buffalo, much beaver, clean water. Women do all the work, men hunt and fish all day and have sex all night. <coughs> Only white man stupid enough to think you can improve on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, the clock is ticking. Well, let's see. Physics. It's, I think, the, the Greek word for nature, uh, what you're born into, what is the given, uh, what is unchanging. That's how the term has evolved. And our ideas of what is the given or what is unchanging do evolve and change. Uh, but uh, Kurt Johnson uh, has uh, given us uh, what his physics, uh, his unchanging uh, ideas are, and I think they are open to evolution and change. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, and uh, democracy, or, oh, he also uh, thinks that ourselves may expand, grow, change, uh, but they also may contract. We may shut out our attachments to other people, uh, uh, to our pets, uh, to uh, our society, whatever our society may be. <laughs> and we have to uh, grow and we have to change, we have to make our identifications with others, and uh, we are an affectionate human, uh, human beings. We do have our attachments, and we do have to detach sometimes. Take it if you want tomorrow. Okay. What we do to make our society more peaceful may not necessarily be more just and really more uh, loving or uh, so, so you have to watch various uh, programs uh, for 
uh, reshaping our social ideals, uh, particularly when they are around self-interest with uh, nar rather narrow selves. I looked over the uh, handout for the meeting <coughs> and uh, it reminded me not so much of a grand but there's a glimmer of blue thing of Mises in there. And certain uh, illusions during the talk reminded me of the same thing. Now Mises developed a whole system of economics around the central premise of the Austrian School of Economics that every human action is an attempt to substitute a more a preferable state of affairs for a less preferable state of affairs. Now he didn't quite develop that thesis. But I think something got to read and become familiar with it. And he tried to incorporate it into his own presentation. But uh, the presentation I kind of wanted to develop is that there's a law of physics that matter cannot be created or destroyed, the law of conservation of matter. You guys, socialists and union has to incorporate that into your own presentations. You wouldn't be going around thinking that there's going to be more wealth because of some union regulation or some government law. And who actually pays through the additional wealth? Where does the additional wealth come from? The minimum wage laws. You never explain that. You yeah, kind of believe in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy or whatever. There's something there that's going to present it. Take from the rich. Well, you, uh, one fool at a time, which has happened to me here is truly right now, but I've been trying to tell you guys for years. <laughs> but, uh, you, you're not really taking from the rich. All this Communist Manifesto stuff, you're taking from everybody. Or if you ever get ambitious enough to look up Keynes economic consequences to the peace, there's a brilliant page and a half or so of how punishing the currency takes from everybody from forward from redistributing the wealth. It's what establishes the distribution of wealth in the first place. But I guess I'm, you know, I haven't really gotten to the point where I can get that across. I, uh, that's, maybe that's a little too abstract, I mean. But, uh, you guys are always trying to moralize something. Uh, that's what I see in contrast to physics. Physics is like uh, a bunch of falling dominoes. Is there any morality? You ever see these big layouts of falling dominoes where one domino falls over and next to us later there's several hundred or maybe several thousand dominoes fall over? That's kind of how the market works in a way. There's about as much of a moral, there is no superintending moral intention to that. It's, a, uh, it's an invisible hand. I'll give you my address. So the speaker wants to develop the idea of physics in a market. Then you'd be well off to study the invisible hand and how the invisible hand works. Because that's not something that's directed by any one particular individual. But I think you guys, what you guys really know, it's not so much getting better wages or uh, 
dissolving grievances or anything. I think you guys just kind of want to throw your weight around and exert your own will. And, you know, and you want to haul a bullshit, anything you don't like, like you did last week several times, which is quite contrary to free speech. So, I don't know. If that's the way you guys are going to be, that's the way you're going to be, and I guess there isn't a whole lot I can do about it. my conclusion too. It'll take me a while to get there. Um, yeah, human nature. Yeah, that's my name. Uh, has had two senses. One, there's a factual sense, what traits humans do in body, all humans. Uh, things like agriculture, flight, conception, polio, tolerance, small time, play, I call it. <coughs> I, I, I don't get why these are on the list whatsoever. These are hardly crucial. Speakers are. Crucial. No, it, it was unplugged. Right. I. While it's late, I'm going to keep going. Because David wants to talk too. Um, yeah, the usual traits of you know, what makes a human tick are. Well, there's also the. The uh, prescriptive sense of human nature, of what humans ought to be, and to me that's a lot more uh, important than what they are. Uh, <clears throat> and they'll make much more of a difference. How, what we are, you know, you can do surveys of that. <clears throat> kind of dull, if you ask me. But, uh, uh, the, the, uh, we've really forgotten who we are, so it's good to try and get back to human nature. The usual traits are given are good and bad. I've <coughs> almost all things are saying humans are bad, especially Freud says we want to have sex and kill our neighbors. That's a quote from Freud. <coughs> but uh, uh, very few say we're good. Shakespeare, what a piece, what a piece of work is man, how admirable and noble in reason, or something like that. Doug can quote for you. <laughs> If you ask, I have a line about it too. Uh, add to that a lot. Uh, yeah, rational, irrational, peaceful, war, warlike, uh, socials are loner, so altruist or egress, there's, there's a lot of views on what is human nature. Uh, it's hardly one thing. We're more like walking contradictions in many ways. There are a lot of abuses of the concept of human nature. Like, like we could excuse greed, selfishness, meanness, slavery, which Aristotle did. Um, <clears throat> he justified slavery as uh, human nature, that the strong would control the weak, the so first to enslave people. Uh, <clears throat> but a good use of uh, human nature is to try and unite humans, understanding human nature, trying to unite humans into successful societies. Uh, but how do you do that? Well, I think science is a very poor way of doing that. Um, I think uh, physics explains little about humans. I'd use biology a lot more. I would use physics. And then all you get is facts, anyhow. Again, that adult fans. Um, but I think that whole approach and that whole perspective is pretty narrow. <coughs> narrow minded and arrogant. On the part of science to say, well, all we could know is what we could physically measure about humans or anything. I mean, there's a hell of a lot more in, in, in philosophy than you dreamed of. Rachel. If you burn your body, do you uh, burn me? Burn my body, burn me, you said. <coughs> Well, no, hell no. There, there'd be a lot more surviving my my body, and it doesn't it doesn't come from other people's bodies either. It comes from ideas, and these ideas really do exist. If you ask me, these ideas really do, do exist, and we discover them with our brains. Uh, we don't make them up in our brains. A lot of people think we just make them up. But it, no, well, you know, we make up a lot of ideas, but those are the crazy ones, usually, and. Uh, you know, there's a world out there, and we have to know it, and ideas about it, but there's also a world of uh, ideas, too, that exists. I wouldn't reduce everything to uh, 
the matter and the facts. <clears throat> that lacks a lot of imagination, it lacks understanding. All you could get is, you know, scientific principles is the more the most you can get. You can't get human nature or a good society out of that. <clears throat> so we should we need to know to make it short, we, uh, we need to know deep truths about life. Uh, <clears throat> and not little dinky facts about people. Uh, we need to know deep values like the truth and goodness and justice and beauty and free will. And all these, I think, these ideas really do exist outside of our minds. Uh, and, and these can guide us. These values can guide us personally and collectively into a meaningful society. But that's a lot of work. That's a, that's a ton of work, and I myself don't think there's anything I could do about it uh, to bring that about it. I should be brief, particularly considering the lateness of the hour. A little louder, please. The speaker doesn't work. You be brief. <laughs> First of all, my, my comments here basically are directed not so much to the speaker this evening, they are rather directed toward our fellow student from Indiana. <laughs> First of all, in, in talking about how the Declaration of Independence doesn't have much to say about equality, he neglected to quote Thomas Jefferson's whole phrase when he said that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think that's a, I think that there's a little bit more there than, than you talked about when you just said, well, it doesn't mention equality. You treated equality if it were just so much gin music. Uh, number two, you also spoke of, well, Charlie doesn't, uh, doesn't understand labor, he doesn't understand labor, that uh, he thinks these people are all wage slaves, that they can just go to work for somebody else. Well, it's not so cut and dried as all that. And not everybody has the resources to go to work for somebody else. And yes, that's why we need the help of labor unions to make sure that those of us who can't go to work, uh, uh, instead of who are stuck working for somebody else, that uh, our rights are protect, our rights as employees are properly protected. And last but not least, you said that Heraclitus was right. And that war is the father of all things. Well, war certainly is the father of some things. To say that all human invention and all human creativity stems from war is baloney. Uh, flight didn't start, didn't, uh, which was spoken of earlier. That didn't, uh, as I understand it, that didn't come from, from uh, war. Thank you. Okay, speaker gets the last word. Well, okay. Yeah. You like inequality? <laughs> yes. You think it's good? Well, yes, it is. All right, guys. He gets the, the speaker gets the last word. The speaker gets the last word. Loud, please. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I take no offense to anything that was said. Let the microphone's off. Let's turn off the. Uh, well, uh, the so much for science and technology. <laughs> I, I take no offense to what you said. You know, most of you have 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years invested in a field. You think you know something? I have 10, 15, 25 years invested in that field. You've heard two hours of it at most. You think you're ready to know what I'm talking about. In your field, you didn't know shit about what you know today about your field in the first few years of what you were taught when you learned your field. So I'm, just, I'm not being rude, but you know, you're asking to have clear understanding of an idea I'm proposing to you. And I'm giving you the pieces so that we can build that in. And I intend to come back if you'll let me come back. I don't, I'm, you know, we can keep working this if you want to. If you don't, but I mean, and, and the other side of it is, I've read a damn lot of books, but there's a million books that you have published, and I can't read them all, and I don't know everybody. And, but on the other hand, I've heard a lot of people tell me why I'm wrong. 
In order to know why I'm wrong, you have to know what's right. If you know what's right, why don't you go save this world, change the problems in this world, stop this global warming problem, solve the social problems, and let's get on with it. If you know what's right, go show me. The problem is everybody's talking theories, and I'm bringing a new one in. But I don't have much faith in the ones you're quoting. Because I've had studied some of these ideas. I, and I maintain I can understand why they don't work. And I'd like to tell you that. But it's not going to happen in two hours. It's not going to happen in one hour. So um, it is physics. It's the nature of things. Tonight all I dealt with was one aspect of the nature of humanity. Ah, thanks, and all I dealt with was the nature that's necessary to build a successful social organization. But I didn't say anything about love. I didn't say anything about justice. You're right. But I didn't mean we don't, that's, those aren't important elements. But I guarantee you, if you solve the social problem, you will find a lot more love among people. They will love the world they live in. They will love the, the, the opportunity that is in front of them. They will be more respectful of each other because we'll be in their best interest. I don't have to, those things are not drivers of experience. They are evidence of experience. You can't change the world by loving them. But if you change the world, you find that people start loving them. That's procreation. That's just so So, you know, I know everybody has different ideas about what's right and wrong, and I'm just presenting mine. And I, I've read a lot of people, and one of the things I found out was that on the social side, nobody can solve the problem that's in front of us. If they could, they would have done it. And we're in the same boat that before George Cayley, a lot of people had ideas about how to fly, but they couldn't do it. Cayley solved the problem. And when he solved the problem, and he took it where he took it, everybody said, you're an idiot. So much so that the scientific community actually didn't further that idea. It was a bunch of, you know, it was people outside of the, the mainstream schools that solved the problem of flight. Mm. Thank you. Because the people in the schools already knew the answer to flight. They knew what was going to cause flight or what would, why you couldn't fly. So, you know, it's just a little piece. It's the piece of us that fits in a bigger picture. I can't give it to you all in one night. I couldn't give you all in what, five hours. I couldn't give it all to you in ten hours. I'll be honest with you. But the question is, how are we going to solve these problems that are in process? That's what I work for. I say maintain it's a physical problem. We solve it by physical means. And we are physical creatures. And the answer is in physics. And all I worked about was the physical nature of humanity tonight. That's important to this problem. And there's a big range of humanity. He doesn't want to do one. All right. Thank you all for coming. And we get your intangible. Don't forget your marbles. Yeah.